Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, Connecting Values and Career to Climate Action, presented by the Riley Institute at Furman and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. This is the final session of three evenings where we have examined the science of climate change, impacts already felt worldwide, and paths to reducing carbon. The hope, to quote Vice President Al Gore, is that we'll flip the switch on our heating planet. Last week, we heard from industry leaders who are shifting the culture toward clean energy and carbon neutrality. As they work to ensure future competitiveness and meet consumer demand, we're seeing a sea change within companies such as Millican as they prioritize reaching science-based targets to achieve net zero carbon emissions. With industry finally getting it, and innovative companies like Proterra Transit leading the way to a clean energy society, there is reason for optimism for our future. Tonight, we think about what all of us can do and how our values connect us to action on this critical issue. Some of you, some of you in this room are asking, well, what about Furman? What is Furman doing as a leading liberal arts university to work with both the local and campus communities and respond during this moment of crisis? I'll say that Furman has been responding through two specific paths. First, we've been working toward a goal of carbon neutrality by 2026 for many years. In 2007, Furman was one of the first American universities to sign the President's Climate Commitment, which committed us to tracking our greenhouse gas emissions and to implementing a plan for carbon neutrality. We've made some great strides. We've decreased our carbon footprint by 46% from 2007 to 2021. And while we're not where we need to be, this is something to be proud of. Some contributing factors to this achievement are our 743 kilowatt solar farm, which supplies about 5% of Furman's electricity needs. The replacement of the North Village's conventional HVAC system with a geothermal system, one of the cleanest forms of clean energy, which, by the way, will save us about $2 million in energy costs over the next 20 years. We're continuing to work to improve building efficiency campus-wide We've built eight LEED certified buildings on campus. That's a certification that recognizes efficient, cost-effective buildings that are healthier for occupants and for the environment. And we're now taking, undertaking a large retrofit of our campus lighting to reduce energy use. Secondly, sustainability is intertwined in everything we do at Furman. This is why Furman has been recognized as the number three performer overall among baccalaureate institutions in the 2022 Sustainable Campus Index, the most widely recognized report card in the world, world for sustainability performance in higher education. We are committed to educating our students to go out and do the work of climate response in small and in large ways. We, t we teach sustainability and climate change really well. Furman Sustainability and Science major offers a unique and rigorous curriculum. And through the Shy Institute for Sustainable Communities, faculty and students collaborate on cross-curricular sustainability research and tackle real-world sustainability problems. However, we know that we have more work to do. We are now just four years away from our goal of being climate neutral in 2026. Will we reach this ambitious goal? We will not, but neither are we backing away from it. So what are our barriers? The most significant barrier is that purchased electricity is our biggest driver of carbon emissions. As you heard on the stage last week, Industries need utility companies to buy in in order to help them meet their carbon neutrality goals. Similarly, 
Universities in South Carolina would benefit if utility companies move to an infrastructure that is more dependent on renewable energy. Also, since we are now pushing the mandated limit on on-campus solar energy production allowed, legislation that raises the limit could go a long way toward helping us reach our emissions goals. There's more to be done. We need to review and reimagine and renew our internal commitment to reduce our energy consumption and improve energy efficiency. We will soon bring on the next executive director of the Shy Institute for Sustainable Communities, and we look forward to evaluating appropriate next steps with the arrival of this new campus sustainability leader. You'll hear more about this soon. Thank you for being here tonight and for your interest in this critical issue and for the work that many of you, especially our students, are doing and will do to accelerate climate crisis solutions. It is now my pleasure to welcome via Zoom former Congressman Bob Inglis, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Thank you, and wonderful to be with you, uh, by video at least. I'm very pleased to introduce to you one of the most important science communicators in the whole world when it comes to climate science. Uh, one of really the most effective communicators of what we need the public to know about climate science. That's Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. She is the, uh, she's the Paul Whitfield Horn Distinguished Professor and Endowed Chair in Public Policy and Public Law and Public Administration in the program of Department of Political Science, that's a long thing there, Catherine, uh, <laughs> at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. She's also the chief scientist of the Nature Conservancy, a global conservation organization. So um, Catherine has a BS in uh, physics and astronomy from the University of Toronto and an MS and PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and has been awarded doc honorary doctorates from Colgate University, Trinity College, Victoria College, and the University of Toronto. But I've got to tell you a personal story about the first time that I met oh. this very famous <laughs> uh, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. We were at a conference at the University of Michigan and uh, okay, I should disclose, I'm an Episcopalian. I'm about to make an Episcopalian joke, okay? So that's a trigger alert for any Episcopalians in the audience. <laughs> I watched this scene unfold. Catherine sat with an Episcopal priest at a table and there was a chair available for me and I very much wanted to meet Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. So I went and sat down and got in on the last part of the conversation where Dr. Catherine Hayhoe, the atmospheric scientist that I was just describing, was explaining scripture to the Episcopal priest. It appeared to be a case, <laughs> it, 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 it appeared to be a case of first impression for the Episcopal priests, okay? And so <laughs> it was new news to the priest. Uh, anyway, so I sat there and I thought, you go, Catherine, you are the genuine article, somebody who can explain climate science to many people who need to hear it in various ways, including a faith frame. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend and somebody that I respect a great deal, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. Thank you so much, Bob. And I just realized you might all have heard me laughing as Bob was telling that story. Um, two important things Bob forgot to mention, and that is that he and I share an honor together. A number of years ago, we were both um, together as a unit um, appointed to Politico's list of people, thinkers and doers who are changing American politics. And it was such an honor for me to share that with him. And then the second important thing is that I am not a Furman graduate, but my husband is. So I have that personal connection and I'm looking forward to visiting campus myself in the future next year. So I'm so pleased to be the third speaker in the series and the way that I'm thinking of it is this. The first talk you heard was about the head, the facts, 
climate is changing, humans are responsible, the impacts are serious. The second talk was about the hands. What can we do about it? There are so many things we can do. As I often say, there's no silver bullet, but there's a lot of silver buckshot. Through being more efficient in the way we use our energy and our food, that could take care of almost half the problem. Through investing in nature, that could take care of almost a third of the problem. And then, of course, there's clean energy and electrifying everything. There are so many things we can do, and that's the hands. But there's one important piece of the equation missing. The head, the hands, and the heart. So that's what I want to talk about today is the heart. Because the heart is what engages us. It's what motivates us. We have information in the brain, we figure out what we can do with our hands, but what drives us forward is our heart. So I wanna start by asking you a few questions. This is gonna be a dialogue between us here. And the way you do it is pretty easy. You take out your phone if you have a phone. If you don't, you can just follow along, that's okay. Take out your phone and you can take a picture of this with your phone and it will take you to my website. Otherwise, if you wanna type it in, you can type in Pole EV, P O L L E V dot com slash Catherine. You have to make sure to spell it right K A T H A R I N E. Um, and when you have clicked on that QR code or you have typed in pole EV dot com slash Catherine with two A's, then I'm going to ask you a question. Now, the first question I'm going to ask you is to be very easy. And the question I'm gonna ask you first is, who are you? Are you, oh, no surprise, the students are off the mark first. <laughs> you were probably born with your thumbs on a keyboard. So are you a student? Are you staff or faculty? Are you alumni? Are you a community member? Excellent, looks like you've got the hang of this already. So our students are holding firm at about 60%, but Community members are, are the next biggest, oh, almost 30%. Staff and faculty, 8%, and alumni, around 5 Oh, it looks like students were quick off the mark, and now community members are catching up. Do you sort of feel like this is election night? <laughs> I don't know. You thought somebody was off to an early lead, but then somebody's catching up. Okay, great. So now, now that you've got warmed up, I want to ask you a harder question. And this next question, I want you to answer with a word. Any word you want, but only one word. Not two, just one. Ready? The question I'm gonna ask you is this. When I say climate change, how do you feel? When I say climate change, how do you feel? One word. Scared, depressed, worried, sad, stressed, overwhelmed, hopeless, challenged, perplexed, resigned. You know what? Oh, I like the emoji there. That is a very appropriate emoji. You are not alone. In fact, I have asked this question, the same question, to several hundred people over the last couple months. I have asked architects in Canada. I have asked Catholic nuns in the Northeast. I have asked Mormons in Utah. I have asked university students in California. I have asked business people who work for Netflix. I have asked people across the US and around the world, how do they feel about climate change? And you know what answers I get? Exactly this exactly this this is how we feel about climate change so if you feel nervous worried scared concerned frustrated you are not alone the majority of people feel this way and not only that but this makes sense it makes sense because as far back as we go in the history of the planet we have never seen this much carbon going into the atmosphere this quickly we are truly conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home we have. And why does it matter? It matters because it is quite literally affecting every single thing that we depend on for life. The quantity and the quality of our food, we all need food. The quality and availability of our water, we all need water. 
the quality of the air that we breathe. We all need clean air to breathe. And burning fossil fuels is producing so much air pollution, it's responsible for 10 million premature deaths a year, double the number of COVID. And it's even affecting the buildings and roads and the systems we use, our roads, our highways, our homes, our electricity systems, our water systems, all of them were built for a planet that no longer exists because climate is changing faster than any time in the history of humans on this planet. And the way that we're seeing it affecting us is obvious in the headlines. I mean, this summer, you know, it's been crazy for quite a while now, especially if you're a climate scientist, you know, kind of tracking what's happening, but you could not miss it this summer. Every time you turn around, there is a new drought, a new flood, a new heat wave, a new wildfire, and we're just getting started with the hurricane season. Climate change is loading the weather dice against us, taking our naturally occurring extreme events, because we've always had heat waves and droughts and floods and storms, and supersizing them, making them bigger, longer, stronger, and more frequent. So if you feel worried, if you feel scared, if you feel concerned, if you feel overwhelmed, that is a logical, rational, reasonable response to what science tells us is happening to our world. In fact, if you didn't feel that way, you'd be the odd person out. But here's a key shift in our perspective. Often people say, okay, well then we have to save the planet. But it isn't really the planet itself that needs to be saved. We're okay, we just have to save the planet. No, 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 it's the opposite. The planet will survive, the question is, will we? And not just us humans, but many of the other living things that share this planet with us, that is the question mark. So it isn't a conflict between people or the planet or the energy you know, environment or the economy. It's either all of us <laughs> or nothing. And what that means is whoever we are, we're the perfect person to care, as long as we live on this planet. So often then we think, well, if people just knew how bad it was, surely they changed their minds, right? So let's load up our wheelbarrow of entirely true scary facts about Antarctica and the polar bears and the doomsday glacier and the sea level rise. Let's load up our wheelbarrow of facts and just dump it on all these people who aren't doing anything about the problem. This is actually a little cartoon from my YouTube series called Global Weirding. Not warming, but weirding, because it's really just getting weird, right? So this is one of our videos. You know, if I just knew the facts, surely they changed their minds, right? But here's the way our brains work. Climate changes and we get worried. So what do we do? We figure we have to share more scary data because if people aren't doing anything, they need to be more scared. But it turns out that our human brains are wired such that if we're scared, but we don't know what to do, we do nothing. In fact, we sort of go back to bed and pull the blankets up over our head. And so when it comes to a global issue like climate change that is caused by 8 million people on the planet, we feel like I'm just one person, how can I make a difference? And more and more exposure to scary information causes more and more people to just dissociate from it and inaction results. There's a neuroscientist who studies people's brains. Her name is Tally Sherrod, and one of the things she says is this. And she's not actually talking about climate change, but of course she is actually talking about climate change, right? She says, fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. And you know what? That's exactly what's happened to us. Because when we look at the polling data, and I'm a big believer in following polling data because we often make assumptions about what people think. I think it's really important to actually know what people think. When we look at the polling data for the United States, we see that as of last year, and this year the number is going to be higher, I can guarantee it. As of last year, 70% of Americans were already worried. 70%. The numbers are higher when you look at smaller groups. 83% of mothers are worried. 86% of young people are worried. So you might say, oh my gosh, so that many people are worried. Well, then why aren't we seeing more action? 
It's because fully half of us feel hopeless and helpless and don't know where to start. And so as a result, you know how many people are actually activated? 8%. 70% are worried, 8% are activated. Now this is really important because we often think the biggest gap is between people who are or aren't worried. And if you're not worried, you should be. And how do you get worried by understanding this really is a serious problem? That gap is less than 30%. The much bigger gap, in fact, double, double the gap, more than 60%, is between people who are already worried and people who are activated. How are you going to get people who are already worried activated? Not by sharing more scary information. They're already there. What's going on? Why aren't they activated? It turns out there's two things that are going on. First of all, we don't understand why it matters so urgently to us personally. We understand Antarctica, polar bears, ice sheets, sea level rise, but here and now where I live, the things at the top of my mind, why does it matter to me today? And also, we don't understand what we can do to fix it. I mean, I'm not a president. I'm not a prime minister. I'm not the head of a major corporation. Um, you know, I'm not a massive social media influencer with millions of followers. So we think, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. And so what do we do? We do nothing. So let's dig into each of these a little bit. First of all, the first one is a human defense mechanism. When we don't know what to do about something, we dissociate from it. We see it as far away in time or space or being abstract rather than concrete or irrelevant to our primary concerns. And all of these are in play with climate change. Let me show you the data. This is a map of public opinion for every county across the US, and I have highlighted Greenville County, so you can see it right here. When you ask people, is global warming happening, most people say yes. 72% across the US, 66% in Greenville County, that's two thirds of people. Okay, orange means greater than 50% and the darker orange, the more people say yes. Do you think it will harm plants and animals? About the same numbers. Distant in terms of what? Relevance. We're talking about non-human species here. Sure, it's real and it will affect non-human species. Still comfortably removed from us. How about future generations? How are they removed from us? In time. Yeah. Sure, future generations, same numbers. What about people who live over there, people removed from us in terms of space? Yeah, I think it will affect people in developing countries, people who live over there, not people who live here. And then they ask the money question, do you think it will affect you? Look at this precipitous drop. All of a sudden, there's this huge gap. We think it'll affect future generations, plants and animals, people who live over there, but not me. And there's an even darker blue map. And what do you think that one is? Do you ever talk about it? <gasps> Look at this. Do you ever talk about it, at least occasionally? Just by attending this, this event, you are now in the 32%. Why does this matter? It matters profoundly because what we talk about is the window to our mind. And when we engage with others, that is how we catalyze change. If you don't talk about it, why would you care? And if you don't care, why would you do anything about it? So here's where we have to step back and ask ourselves, why do I care? And if I understand why I care, how can I help other people care? It isn't a matter of getting them to care for the same reason as I do. So let's, let's be, you know, let me actually take you to my inventory. Here's my inventory of who I am. I care about science. I care about my home country of Canada. I care about the state where I live, which is Texas. I love to ski, so I care about snow. I have a son, so I care about his future. And I'm a Christian. So I care about the poor and the disadvantaged who are disproportionately affected by the impacts of a changing climate. Now, I'm gonna give you a kind of a silly example, but I hear people say this all the time. Does everybody have to become a skier to care about climate change? 
Of course not. That would be ridiculous, right? But so often we try to make people care for the same reason we do before they're sort of allowed to act on climate change. Instead, we have to realize that everybody already has every reason they need to care, whoever they are. They could be a gardener. They could fish. They could be a veteran. They could be a healthcare professional. They could be a child. They could be a grandparent. They could live in South Carolina or North Carolina or Georgia or Maine. They could be a Christian or not a Christian. They could be somebody who cares passionately about nature or birding or kayaking, or they could be somebody who doesn't care about that, but their home has been flooded four times. So what we have to do is not convince people to care for the same reason we do. We have to figure out what they already care about and help them connect the dots. And the first step to that is figuring out why we care. You might think it's self-evident, but I'm gonna ask you to do this now. Go ahead and take your phones back out, Go to that polyv.com slash Catherine, hopefully it's still there. And I'm gonna ask you for another word, but this time I'm asking you for a word that says, I care about climate change because I am a what? Who are you that makes you the perfect person to care about climate change? And I don't wanna see the same words here. I wanna see different words. Good job, everybody's got it in there. We've got somebody who's a runner, somebody who's a teacher, somebody who's a naturalist. Somebody who's a mother and an environmentalist, a parent, a hiker, a homemaker. Somebody who's asthmatic, absolutely. Somebody who's simply a citizen or a scientist or a nature lover. And I love what's coming in the middle here. Somebody who's a human. All we have to be is a human who cares about the place where we live, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the safety of our home. Whoever we are, we're the perfect person to care. And whoever somebody else is, is also the perfect person to care. But they might care for a different reason than we do, and that is okay. A hundred percent okay. We just have to help them connect the dots between who they are and why they care. I love this list. This is a phenomenal list. Emojis and everything. All right. So how does this connect to action? It connects because people are willing to change if they feel a sense of efficacy, like what I do can make a difference. How do we instill efficacy? Not by talking about global treaties or you know multinational corporate action, unless you happen to be a CEO, in which case we could certainly talk about that, but by talking about changes that we can see enacted where we are. So we recognize that the giant boulder of climate action is not sitting at the impossible, at bottom of an impossibly steep cliff with only Al Gore and Greta Thunberg pushing on it. And it's not even budging an inch. That giant boulder is already at the top of the hill. It already has millions of hands on it. It's already rolling downhill in the right direction. And when you add yours and when others add theirs, it will go faster. And what do those solutions look like? They often look like local solutions. They can certainly happen at the scale of entire countries, and there's countries who are in on it. They can certainly happen at the scale of companies, and there are big companies who are in on it. These solutions can happen at the scale of cities, and there's a lot of cities that are in on it. Now, you see what we're doing? We're going down, down, down here, right? Countries, corporations, cities. They can happen at the scale of churches, and there are a lot of churches who are in on this. They can happen at the level of colleges, universities, and seminaries. They can happen at the level of individuals, mothers, young people, grandparents, students. These changes, these actions can happen at every level. Oops, I should have had the seminaries and the universities and colleges switched with those. At every level, we can have action, and you heard a great summary of the action that's happening at Furman today. And why is that action happening? Because someone used their voice to say, hey, why don't we do this? And further are using their voice to say, hey, can we change the policy so we can do more? Action begins with using your voice. And so I wanted to highlight, since you have a phenomenal panel coming up here in about one or two minutes, I wanted to highlight that there are some ways that we can dig in ourselves, no matter who we are and no matter how old we are, and the Nature Conservancy, which I'm part of, and which our South Carolina director, will be part of the panel coming up, is, is in charge of. We have amazing projects where people can actually 
literally pick up a shovel, pick up some gloves. These are a group of AmeriCorps interns who worked in the Peachtree Rock Heritage Park this last summer, putting up signs, clearing trails, talking to the conservation easement folks who own the land and making sure it's managed properly. To preserve our biodiversity, to store carbon in our ecosystems where we want it, instead of up in the atmosphere where we don't, and to provide a better quality of life for people in the Carolinas. What about the areas that are flooding? In Andrews, people have been flooded again and again and again. I mentioned somebody whose house might have been flooded four times. Andrews is one of those communities. Why are they being flooded? Impervious surfaces, building in a floodplain because often that's the only place they can build, and climate change loading the weather dice against us. So building rain gardens with people in the community that provide a place for the water to go and where people can see the evidence of what they have done in their community to make their homes and their neighborhood a better place. Oh, and of course, all of that green stuff soaks up carbon too. Or along the, along the shoreline where rising seas are eroding the shoreline, but building a living shoreline that enables that protects the structures inland, that accounts for rising seas, that protects the ecosystems, and again, helps to store the carbon. There's win-win-win solutions that are good for us today and good for us tomorrow, and a lot of those solutions are right here in the places where we live. They help to clean up our air, they help to protect us from flooding, they help to protect us from heat, oh, and they help with climate change too. The science is clear that our choices matter. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says every action matters, every bit of warming matters, every year matters, every choice matters. You matter. How does the world change? One person at a time. And how do we as individuals change the world? By using our voice to catalyze change wherever we are, whoever we're connected with. So when climate changes and we get worried, don't load up your wheelbarrow of scary facts about Antarctica, unless you live in Antarctica, in which case definitely do, but rather talk about what's happening in South Carolina, how it affects you, your life, the things you care about, how it would affect the things the person you're speaking with would care about too, whether they are a city, an organization, a university, a colleague, a friend, a politician, and what positive constructive solutions look like, and then what happens, people feel empowered, and action results, why? because that's the way our brains are wired. According to the neuroscience, our brain is built to associate forward action with a reward, not avoiding harm. So reframe your message so the information you provide induces what? Hope, not dread. That is how we close that giant gap between the people who are afraid and worried and scared and frustrated, as we should be, and the people who are activated by showing what we can do to make a difference. And there's somebody who I think knows a little bit about that. Her name is Greta. And she said, the one thing we need more than hope is action. Because once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So before we close, I'm gonna ask you one final question and I'm gonna hand it over to the panel. And the question is this, same question. Knowing that the biggest gap we have is between people who are worried and people who are activated and knowing that bridging that gap depends on connecting the dots between our head, our hands, and our heart. And each of us has a role to play through using our voice to catalyze change wherever we are in our church, in our university, in our friend group, in our city, in our organization. How do you feel? It is reasonable to still feel scared. It is totally rational to still feel daunted. But by choosing to act, that is how we make a difference. And after we choose to act, that is where we find our hope. So thank you so much. This has been so great to be with you virtually and you have a phenomenal panel coming up to dig into specific positive construction actions that people can take right there where you live. Thank you, Dr. Hayhoe. Thank you very much. That was very inspirational. Excellent. I do want to know, though, um, who 
cares about climate because they think they're Al Gore. <laughs> um, as a reminder, uh, my name is Matt Cohen. I'm a faculty in the Department of Earth, Environmental and Sustainability Sciences here at Furman, and I'll be facilitating the panel for tonight. Um, so I'll go ahead and invite our panelists to come to the stage. While they're um, on their way up here, I want to remind everybody about the QR code on your program. If you have any questions for the panelists during this conversation, uh, please scan the QR code and visit that site uh, to log your questions. We have a team backstage that are cataloging your questions as they come in, and we will go ahead and um, pose them to the panelists at the end. Y'all can come on up. So we have joining us tonight um, Dr. Jeffrey Habron. He's a Furman Professor of Sustainability Science. Um, Dr. Habron is part of a multi-institutional effort to develop equitable climate resilience solutions in at-risk communities across the Carolinas. And I have the uh, personal pleasure of calling him a colleague. Welcome. Um, next, we have uh, Emily Wurzba. Emily is a 2013 graduate of Furman who has been a longtime advocate for social justice and climate action. She's currently at the Environmental Defense Fund, where she develops legislative strategies to advance EDF's transportation, electrification, and climate change priorities. Also joining us on the stage is Dale Threat Taylor, the head of the Nature Conservancy in South Carolina. Dale has 25 years of conservation leadership and deep academic ex expertise in agricultural sciences. So please welcome me in joining our panelists. Welcome to Furman. Thank you. All right. Uh, Y'all excited to, to be it, back. For me, <laughs> thank you. I'm excited too. This has been fun. So the title of this week's session is Connecting Values in Career to Climate Action. I think that's why we're all here. Um, the three panelists on the stage are all engaged in climate action in very different ways. And so I'd like to start by asking each of you um, to tell us a little bit about what you do and how you're contributing to climate action through uh, your work. So we'll start with Jeffrey and maybe work our way back towards me. Great. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Habron and I uh, teach sustainability science at Furman University. And in particular, I teach a couple classes that focus on climate. One is resilience and adaptation. It's a 300 level class. Um, it's offered in the spring uh, for students who are looking for electives. Um, that's a class that's offered. Um, I also teach a class on sustainability and social justice. Um, and so since this theme is on values, social justice is very important to me. So I created a class on sustainability and social justice. Um, and then I supervise uh, our majors on thesis research. And so I've got uh, two students this summer who are doing climate work. Um, and if you stay after the session, you'll see those posters. So Katie Militello, and John Roper are working uh, in South Carolina on climate change efforts. And then I also teach our senior practicum in the fall. So I have eight students this fall, and we're focusing on looking at building equitable climate resilience in Greenville. Um, and so I see at least one of our collaborators from Trees Upstate is here. I don't know if anyone else is there, but we are working to collaborate with folks in Greenville and promoting uh, more just uh, climate uh, resilience and adaptation. Um, and so those are just a couple examples of what I am doing at Furman uh, and working with students and communities on climate change. Thank you. Emily? Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's really wonderful to be back at Furman. I was a student here and graduated in 2013. And I'm currently with an organization called the Environmental Defense Fund, which is one of the oldest and largest environmental nonprofits. We have over 850 staff globally working all around the world on issues like climate change, clean energy, community resiliency, conservation, public health. And I specifically am on EDF's federal affairs team in Washington, DC. So that means that it's my job to take all of the expertise, research, and uh, economics and data that EDF is producing and trying to get Congress uh, at the federal level to pass legislation that reflects our policy goals based off of our scientific targets. And specifically, right now, I'm working primarily on transportation, electrification, um, and within that, helping to figure out how do we get more policies to electrify things like heavy-duty trucks that are often going through overburdened and disadvantaged communities, polluting, causing air quality problems. How do we get Congress to pass policies to help electrify those vehicles? 
uh, since transportation is our largest emitting sector of emissions in the US. So that's what I'm working on right now, and it's, it's been a really exciting time. We just had major climate legislation make its way through Congress a few weeks ago. So I'm really excited about all the, all the money and solutions that are being put forward. Um, so that's the main thing that I'm doing, but I also uh, really love to train people how to lobby themselves as citizens. So I work a lot with students, other young people, um, to help figure out how to make their voices heard and how they can speak to their elected officials to enact solutions. Hey, thank you. I'm Dale. Um, I'm Dale Threat Taylor, and you get bonus points for pronouncing my name correctly. Um, I am the executive director for the Nature Conservancy for South Carolina. Um, the Nature Conservancy is the largest environmental organization in the world, but the best thing about the Nature Conservancy is, although it's global, the way it's led is local, and we get to focus on what's going on right here in South Carolina, uh, also in the Southern Division. We get to work together. We need to address all the issues that's needed. So our big focus, of course, is land protection, uh, forest management, healthy oceans and fisheries, um, resilience and adaptation, and of course, client, uh, climate work and climate action. So we get to do it all. And I have the joy and the privilege of leading an awesome team here in South Carolina, and our focus is South Carolina. So even though I get to work with Catherine, who's working on a global scale and our leaders, and we know that we live on this one blue marble, as far as I'm concerned, though, South Carolina is a crucial part <laughs> of that. And I know it is because I know how important our upstate is. I know how important our marshes is. And so um, I've been in um, conservation work for 30 years, been in conservation leadership for about 25, and um, that is the, one of the most joyous things to do is to motivate and, and grow a, a team of um, active conservationists in all, all arenas. So, Great, thank yeah. you. Um, I, hope, I hope we're starting to see some emerging trends across the three weeks for those of us who've um, attend all, attended all sessions but we're starting to hear more and more references to working locally, understanding um, what's happening in South Carolina while connected to a national organization. We have representatives working in different parts of the state or working in DC on national policy. And so again, as we think across this series, it's nice to have more and more examples of how acting on climate and developing solutions really is an all hands on deck, working at every level where we have influence. So I'm really excited to have you all here tonight. Thank you. Um, so we have a little background on, on who you are, what you, I, actually, uh, let me back up. We have a little information on what you do, but how about who you are? Mm. So the, um, the themes from Dr. Hayhoe's talk was, was focused a lot on kind of our personal values, who we are, and what animates us. And so my next question kind of gets at that. I would love, maybe we'll start with you, Dale, and we'll go back the other direction. Um, if you could tell us a little bit more about your own story how you came to do the work that you do, and what values motivate you in this space? Uh, well, my story is, I am a country girl. I'm a country girl, I was raised in Union County, North Carolina, um, out in nature, and hated it, so I thought. Had no idea how wonderful my life was. We grew all of our own food. We had to, because according to my parents, we were poor. That's another story for another day on really the level of poverty that we were in. It's, everything's relative. But to be frankly honest, um, we grew our own food. We grew our own chickens that we harvested, and you do not ever get rid of that smell. Um, we had our animals. We fished in the pond. And, and as a child, all you want to do is get away from it. I'm tired of picking okra. You want to get away from it. Who knew years later that I would be advocating for a healthy food supply, that I would be advocating for uh, locally grown food? Things like that impact you, and you have no idea the two worlds that you live in. And that's part of who I am. Um, I grew up in a little missionary Baptist church and later on became Sunday school superintendent. And it was amazing how one of the arguments, kind of like Catherine, where I was always explaining to folks how easy it was for me to be a, an environmentalist who knew who created, you know, the who created the world. That's my personal 
impact and they couldn't understand how I had no problem meshing the two. That's who I am. I also am a big believer that I am not going to be on this planet but for, for a short period of time and I'm going to do everything I can for as hard as I can for as fast as I can and impact as many people as I can with love and understanding of that we better do something we better do it now and that's part of who I am and so people run away <laughs> because I think I tend to scare them off because I'm going to start talking about soils and soil health and regenerative agriculture or I'm going to talk about water quality and people and how we need to raise up a next generation. Oh, thank goodness. Next generation to come along and lead and pick up the gauntlet and run with it. And so that's basically who I am, the values I have. And it needs to be done with a smile and full of energy. And then the last thing I would say is I'm not too old to learn. I was a COVID, a lot of you got pets during COVID. I picked up a fishing rod. Now I catch and release. I'm pescatarian, I don't fry them. I don't keep them, I put them back. But there's nothing like fishing either. And I use that story because it also made me, who's, who's been a conservationist all these years, realize that everybody needs to connect with nature. It, it, it almost, saved me during um, COVID. Uh, getting back in, because it was zoom, 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 zoom. And then getting back, and the first day I caught that fish in the tug of that line, and yet to be out in the environment and also have the birds fly over or smell the clean air and things like that. And I realized that I should be teaching that every single day that nature heals. And then I get paid to do it. That's awesome. I don't think we'll run away. I love it. Sounds like you're in good company. Yeah. All right, so Emily, who are you? What's led you to the work you do and what values are motivating you? Yeah, it's a great question. And I always start with thinking about how I was raised. I spent a ton of time hiking mountains, being at the lake, in the woods, uh, in New Hampshire or in Canada, and I just, I loved being outdoors. And so I think from an early age, I knew I want to be protecting the environment. I want to be focusing on sustainability. But it wasn't until as I started to get a little bit older and learn a little bit more about climate change that I realized it's not just about preserving these beautiful landscapes and places that I like to spend time in. It's about the, the people that are already experiencing harm from these environmental impacts. And, you know, I, I met a friend at a conference who was from the small island nation of Fiji. And she was saying, my country is literally going to be underwater because of sea level rise. Please, can your country do something? Can you take action? And so I think the older I got, the more I realized, wow, no, climate change is actually harming people that I love and care about and consider my friends now. So I'm really motivated to do this work out of concern for my friends and my community that I know are being impacted. But I think kind of an overarching value that has really guided my work uh, this past almost decade, I learned from when I worked at my previous organization uh, called the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which is a Quaker nonprofit. And so Quakers have this religious belief that there is the light or that of God or inherent worth in every single individual. And this has guided kind of Quaker actions throughout history, whether it's on peace movements or equality and abolition movements. But I really, even though I'm not personally Quaker, I deeply identify with these, this Quaker concept of we have to search for that common ground and that shared value in every single person because we believe that there is the light within each person. And so that's been this practice that I've really adopted in my lobbying work and advocacy work. And I wanna tell a really quick story about why I think that can be so powerful when we're doing especially advocacy led by our values. So I work with a lot of student groups, teaching young people how to speak with their own elected officials. And a few years ago, we had a group of middle school Quaker students who came to DC and they wanted to meet with their Republican member of Congress from Pennsylvania. They were really nervous, they were scared to have this conversation, and, I, and you know, we talked about how they should just talk about their own personal stories and why, why they care about climate change and the environment. So they walk up to Congress and they, they walk into the congressional office and sit down at this big conference table and the member of Congress comes in and I think he immediately, he was expecting like a photo op or something, but he realized these kids came with their stories and their values. And, made him see them as a parent, someone who was responsible for their future. And each kid went around the table and told these beautiful stories, connecting with the values that the congressman had himself. 
So one child said, I have asthma and I'm really worried about playing my soccer games with worsening air quality. Um, and a lot of other kids in Pennsylvania have asthma too. Another little girl talked about her favorite community park that was experiencing really kind of out of the ordinary flooding and she was worried about the park being flooded more in the future. And the congressman actually also knew that park and his own children played there. So it was this really beautiful conversation where they were speaking to his values and sharing their own. Um, and at the end of their, their lobby visit with him, he agreed to co-sponsor a bill that would help put forward community resiliency solutions to climate change. It was a small step, but a really beautiful moment, and I think that illustration has just showed me that it's a way to stay hopeful and to, to keep moving forward, even when we're talking about an issue as big as climate change, but really being able to lead with those values and seek common ground, no matter who we're talking to. So that's been something that I've really, I've taken with me to EDF from the Quakers, um, and it continues to guide my work to this day. I love that story. Jeffrey. Well, I'd like, to build, I'd like to build on the fish story there in, <laughs> in growing up. Um, I grew up, uh, growing up, I spent nine out of the first 12 years of my life uh, living in a different country. Um, my dad worked for the U.S. Agency for International Development, and although I was born in the U.S., I have no recollection of the early years of my life. My first memories are of Thailand. Um, and we lived in rural places, and then eventually we lived in Bangkok. And as you might imagine, there are not too many black people in Thailand. Um, so I grew up always uh, around other people. I went to international schools. Um, all I knew was that everybody was different and people looked different, they sounded different, and I was intrigued by that. Um, and then we moved back to the States for a couple of years. I went to public school um, and that was all black. Uh, there were no white people around. Um, and then I went to Nicaragua, an international place, uh, speak Spanish, I went to an international school, there were lots of people around. Um, and so living overseas, I saw the world differently, but one thing was that my dad was very much into the outdoors. He loved to fish, and so we would always go to the ocean, and so I was in love with the ocean. And when I grew up, I wanted to be the black, Jacques Cousteau, and so for the older people in the crowd, you probably know who Jacques Cousteau is. It was on television, and um, because I grew up overseas, I didn't know any better that, oh, black people aren't marine biologists, and if I had grown up in the U.S., probably I would have never thought about that because I would have known, like, these are the things that black people do, and they don't do that. Um, but I grew up and I wanted to do that, but because I had grown up overseas and my dad was involved in international development, I wanted to do that, and I was concerned about how other people lived. And during Nicaragua, we were there during this uh, Sandinista revolution that overthrew uh, President Somoza. So justice and equity was something I grew up with. Uh, I love Martin Luther King. I'm a big Bob Marley fan in reggae that talks about equal rights and justice. I went to college at the University of Miami because I was going to be a marine biologist. But all at the same time, I was like, how can I do this biology thing and then still be concerned about all these other issues? And so um, we had a speaker come in and they had gone into the Peace Corps, which I had grown up with the Peace Corps, but I thought you did health, I thought you did agriculture, and this person did fisheries. And I thought, bam, I wanna do fisheries, I'm gonna go into the Peace Corps. So I went in the Peace Corps, I served on an island, uh, Caribbean in St. Lucia. Um, and there, very quickly, you see how one thing is connected to something else, and that's really what launched my career interest in sustainability. So for me, it's how I grew up is who I am now, and so I have this passion for protecting the environment, but hand in hand, it's making sure that people have access to food, water, shelter, uh, joy, happiness, all of those kinds of things. Um, so it is how I, was, I grew up, and even though I have degrees in master's and PhD in fisheries, my dad would catch the fish um, and he enjoyed it. He did eat it, a lot of fish. <laughs> um, but I was mainly concerned about who else gets access uh, to the fish. And so that's kind of what drives me is because I grew up in this balance between the science of protecting the environment, but how do you do it at the same time of making sure people have access to, to their own human development needs. Okay, thank you. So 
So the three of you represent multiple career pathways, and each of you have in turn collaborated with diverse stakeholders across different sectors and interest groups at different scales. Um, what would you say to members of the audience who might be interested in contributing to climate solutions, but they don't necessarily see how it aligns with the professional work that they do? Um, Maybe we'll go with Emily first, since you haven't, had, you haven't had the opportunity to go first yet. Yeah, I love this question, and one of my favorite things about being in D.C. is you see how climate change is connected to every single other career path and issue. So I want to just give a few examples of kind of unusual suspects that I often work with in coalition on, on climate change issues. Um, there are whole organizations of physicians who are thinking about how climate change and air pollution are affecting the health of their patients. They're engaging on this issue because they're seeing the results in the people that they work with every day. And they're people who are administrators of hospitals who are thinking about how can this building weather an extreme event like a hurricane or a flood? Can, do, can our building continue to generate power to take care of our sick patients during extreme weather events that we know are going to be worsened by climate change? Then I work with people who are in the financial sector, who are dealing with um, huge amounts of money and financial risk, and they're now saying climate change is another one of these risk factors that we're having to add to the list of all of the other kind of financial risks that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I work with people in the labor community who are thinking about, you know, how do we make sure that we're building the new wave of clean energy jobs, building solar panels and electric vehicles here in the U.S.? Um, and then one of my favorites is we work with a lot of people who are just mothers groups. There's a group called Moms Clean Air Force that I work with all the time, and their, their whole deal is how do we protect our children from air pollution and climate change. And so they're out there advocating for electric school buses, and it's a, it's a really, really wonderful group of people. So I think there, we have to think about how every single occupation and job, they're being touched on by extreme weather events, by increased pollution, uh, by some sort of element, and so I think I think really this this touches on everything. Great, thank you, Jeffrey. Would you add anything? Yeah, and I would go back to uh, for those of you that were at the, the previous um, climate talk series, we have something where we engage with with students uh, either before or after the sessions, and I think this whole thing has illustrated the range and the speakers we've had um, here, and so the students who did the artwork um, before the first session, it's like and Catherine Hay who talked about it, it's not just about the facts and the science that come across, it's how do you have people who make connections, and the arts is a wonderful way that people connect to protecting the environment or caring about things, caring about their community, getting people involved is something that we can do with the arts. Um, you talked about issues with policy, and so you can't change things, and even though, yes, I can try to do my own individual thing um, by changing my diet, that's not gonna, you know, all of a sudden reduce greenhouse gas emissions immediately, but dealing at the policy level and changing the regulatory framework for having more renewable energy is, well, that's not what I do, but we need somebody who's an engineer to figure that out. We need somebody who's gonna be on the Hill and lobby and come up with policies to do that. Um, so pretty much, I mean, we teach liberal arts classes here at Furman, and um, I teach our intro classes, and most of the students who are there aren't gonna be sustainability science or environmental science students, and my goal in those classes is that every single one of the students that leaves there feels no matter what their career path is or their passion, that they leave there with saying, oh, Dr. Hebron has shown me or I've seen a way that I can take an action, whether I'm an accounting major, a sculpture major, a violist, um, you name it, that there's something you can do uh, to make that happen, and I think the speakers that we've had on this panel and then uh, through Zoom have illustrated that it's an all hands on deck sort of thing, that no matter what your discipline is, there's a role for you, um, and there has to be a role for you because it's gonna take that much effort um, to make something happen. Great, thank you. And then Dale, I'll, I'll give you the final thought on this before we move into the Q&A. Okay, I bet that was my phone, 7.30. Yeah, uh, this is not, did we not just talk about that, the phone, don't, we were just talking about that. Um, I looked down and I saw 7.30 and I thought, oh, my alarm is going off. Uh, I have so many alarms set, I'm sorry, commercial break right there. Let me tie this together. I love the way you work with, you know, you talked about the act and you talked about the students that you're impacting. For me, I used to work with, um, at a resource conservation workshop with, they were high school students. 
And I knew some of them were at that resource conservation workshop because mom and them made them go to camp during the summer. But I knew they were not all going to be soil conservationists or natural resource conservationists. So my first lecture to them, it wasn't a lecture, we were studying out in the hot sun, was to immediately tell them, no matter what you grow up to do, and when you're 16, 17, and 18, you don't know what you're gonna do. I said, no matter what, you can be an environmentalist. If you're a dentist, you know, you can have the most eco-friendly dentist office. You can talk to your clients about why you use certain products. You can reduce your water use and so forth. And I did that with so many different professions. So to answer that question is on that level. For the audience though, you're not at summer camp. <laughs> but what you need to do is get outside. We still have folks locked down. Get outside, go in nature, and tell yourself and examine yourself and talk to yourself and convince yourself that tomorrow when you get up, there is going to be something that you can do. And you can't do that in a Zoom call. You can because we have to, but you know. But you can only really connect with nature by getting out in nature. And, and I, I say that because all of us need self-examination. I'm a 30-year veteran in conservation, and I still, you know, sometimes push myself and ask myself, am I doing enough? And believe you me, I'm a workaholic, and, and if I'm doing that, then I definitely have no problems. I don't feel guilty at all about challenging you to do that. And the last thing I'll say is give yourself grace, because you're not going to be perfect at it. I know. <laughs> You're not gonna be perfect at it. But it, you know, all we gotta do is try, right? Right? Right, we just gotta try. We'll do it then. And I don't care what my children say, this weekend we're going on a hike. Oh, there you go. Well, let's go ahead and um, welcome out the students that are backstage who have been preparing the questions for the Q&A. Um, as they come out, I wanna remind everybody, when we're done with the program, please don't run away to your cars or dorms. Uh, we do have a program in the lobby where there's a, a dessert social um, and there are students and Ollie um, and community members outside as well to share their uh, work in the climate sphere. So please stick around after we're done. What do we have? So this question's for Dr. Hayron. Hey, what are Furman students doing to combat climate change? What can Furman students do? Um, well, there's a couple of things. Uh, like Dr. Heho said, is uh, identify kind of where you are in the scales. We talk a lot about having a cross scale. So one of the things that uh, is interesting, and in, um, just we had dinner <laughs> this evening, and one of the things that popped up that usually is uh, I eat a vegan diet. Um, and that always generates a bunch of con conversation about, well, why are you doing this? What's your motivation? And, and there's many. But one of those is climate change. And so in general, decreasing meat in your diet uh, is a more climate friendly uh, way to operate. And it's something that you have complete control over. I don't need policy level change. I don't need anything. I can make choices in my diet. And um, it doesn't mean that you have to go meat free all the time. You can say, oh, for this one meal, I am not gonna eat meat or I'm gonna eat more lentils. So and it's not about what you don't eat. What are you eating positive? So lentils are legumes. Uh, they uh, foster the soil because yes, they is. fix nitrogen and improve soil fertility. Um, so that's something that you have complete control over, and especially here at Furman, because we have Bon Appetit as our dining uh, service provider, and there's lots of options, plant-based options in the dining hall. So I would say start there with your diet because you have total control over that. Y'all have no idea the self-control I just had. Anytime I'm talking to somebody and they start, and they mention soils, yeah, I'm just doing so good to stay in this chair. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Dale. What is the best way to protect the Clemson and Furman forest forever? All forests. The best way to protect them forever is good forest management, good forest stewardship, if, um, as well as making sure that um, the folks are in the forest so we can determine what's going on. Um, that forest is a benefit to nature, it's a benefit to wildlife, it's a benefit to birds, but it's also a benefit to humans. And so therefore, don't let me get, okay, I'm trying not to stand up, okay? <laughs> but forests need management. We need forestry, we need forest scientists. Forests are not just a big group of woods or trees that's just left alone. 
I will stand here and say that. Now, I know some of you may come at me, come on, but as far as I'm concerned, good forest management, good stewardship practices, because there is such a thing as kudzu. <laughs> you you let a, let a, just let any patch of woods in the southern USA sit still long enough by itself and not have any forest management. But if we're going to have a good, healthy forest, was it a lonely pine stand that we need to do controlled burns? Do we need to do thing? Oh, let me stop. I'm sorry. I could go on, we could do that later. Support your local Nature Conservancy South Carolina chapter. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, good forest management. Science, the Nature Conservancy is all about the science. Sure, there's politics and arguments and everything, but when it comes down to it, if we're gonna talk about water quality, if we're gonna talk about wildlife, if we're gonna talk about things that matter, clean air, then it's gonna, we need trees. We need to come back to science and data. So good forestry practices, if we're gonna protect the Clemson forest as well as all the other beautiful habitat we have here in South Carolina, it's gonna be about good science and forest management. Said the soil conservationist. <laughs> I did, I stayed in the chair. <laughs> that was a lot of self-restraint. <laughs> so this question is for Emily. With the recent passage of the IRA, what can South Carolina and Greenville expect to change and are the things individuals should advocate for? Yes, I love this question because it's so exciting. We, uh, a few weeks ago, Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which is gonna bring $369 billion in climate change, clean energy, manufacturing, transportation investments. Um, and there are all these new programs being created that are gonna give out grants to various states. And so South Carolina is gonna get a portion of this money. And it's really, really important that us as community members are talking with our school districts, our city councils, our state representatives, and our local agencies to help make sure that they're aware of the funds that are out there and to encourage them to actually apply to get some of this funding. So a great example is from the infrastructure bill that passed last fall, there's now gonna be $5 billion to create a new program at the EPA for electric school buses. Uh, and this is gonna be a grant program that individual school districts, it's up to them to apply for the funding. And so this is an amazing opportunity for school districts around this area to say, hey, I want an electric school bus because it's gonna not only reduce air pollution and help with children's asthma, but it's gonna be quieter, more efficient, and it's gonna also reduce climate pollution. So it's a win-win situation, and this is a great example of something that here people in the audience can be having those conversations with the school board, encouraging them to apply for this funding. That's just one example. There's gonna be funding out there for EV charging infrastructure, for electric transit buses, for community resiliency programs, for clean energy. There's a bunch of money out there, and it's, it's now that we've passed this money, it's up to, to the communities to try to get some of that funding here to make a difference. And Jeffrey, you had something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to, to how many, 350 billion dollars? 369 billion. 369 billion. Okay, so just last week, um, the African uh, Adaptation uh, Conference met uh, in Europe, um, and so we talk about um, making sure that we have equity and climate change. That's something that I bring to the table. Um, and so, you know, the U.S. and the developing countries, we've generated a lot of the carbon emissions that have led this, but we also have the resources to do something about it and make these changes. But in Africa, they're making small claims. They're looking for $25 billion dollars uh, to deal with adaptation. Um, and people aren't raising enough funds to help them to do that, when they only are responsible for 3% of the carbon emissions in the world, and yet you have the Sahel, you have the Horn of Africa, where you have starvation imminent in Ethiopia and Somalia um, for $25 billion, which is, that's too much money, and yet here in the U.S., you know, we just threw out $360 billion. And so even though we want to do think about things locally, I do think it's important to think about who is impacted um, and what are the resources that are available for those communities that don't necessarily have the resources and yet they're the ones who are most impacted. So I want to make sure that we still keep that uh, in our conversations while we're focusing on acting locally. Excellent. Our next question is, what are ways to get involved in local climate action if you don't have much free time? Who don't have free time? <laughs> Ain't that the excuse? I'm, I'm reading a book right now. Oh, I'm sorry, who was that directed to? <laughs> I just started talking. Okay. I'm reading, 
I'm reading a book right now about self-discipline. I don't know why I love my leadership books, and I've been doing these books for years. Um, and, and it's just a constant trying to renew myself and keep going. And I am reading this book that gives all the excuses that we give ourselves for not having enough free time. So tackle that first. I don't cook because I don't want to cook. You know, I can make time to cook. I don't want to. Whoever wrote that question, you must have it in your heart. You must be passionate about the climate. And I said, whatever you do, you wake up, you get ready to go and do, then do it. Make up your mind and do it. You know what it is? What is it? They probably have Dr. Habron in class and they're busy oh. reading. <laughs> Got all that homework. They claim they don't have time. And, and, a, and a plug up for, for the words of Catherine Hayhoe, we can also talk about it. Yeah. And, and the more dialogue we have with each other, um, if you feel disempowered and you don't know where to start, conversations with people you love and care about are always a good place to begin. There's, a, there's 24 hours in each day. All of us get the same amount. When I watched the Emmys, and I wasn't really watching it last night, but it was on, I knew none of those shows. If you knew all those shows, that's where your time is going. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I might make a, a quick plug for some engagement with your elected officials. It can take less than two minutes to pick up the phone and call your senator, your congressman, or congresswoman, um, and just tell them what you think. And uh, we were uh, we had an advocacy workshop earlier this afternoon, and this came up. You know, it's you're actually having conversations with a staff person, and it's a really amazing way to kind of register your desire and what you as a community want our elected officials to do to take action. So I promise it's not scary, especially if you practice it, but those phone calls or, or letters that you write into your elected officials, they really make a difference too. Thank you. It's now as the moderator, I have the pleasure of asking the last question. Um, so this is the last night of a three-part series on a new climate movement. In 30 seconds or less, what's one key thing you'd like to leave with our audience? So we'll start with Dale and move on down the line. One key thing, um, that's, I changed the answer I originally had for that question. That's, that's terrible. You're good. Oh, there. Be flexible. Be flexible. Uh, my, my initial answer was going to be get up and be active and do something, but we've talked about that a lot. But be willing to change if your mindset is, 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 is what we call stiff-necked and hard and solid, be, be, be flexible. It's time to change. We, we, we gotta change things and we can't do it by doing the same thing we've always done. So be flexible. Uh, this is a defining decade. This is like the most critical moment for climate action and I think I feel really hopeful. We've had some really big wins recently but there's a lot of work left to do. But I think uh, we can see, our goals are now within reach, right? And so I think if all of us can just figure out you know, maybe it's not through our career path, maybe it's through our free time, our hobbies, but finding the way that you can make a difference and picking one thing to do and to commit to, um, I just think uh, it's a really pivotal time and I feel really optimistic just knowing that there's so many people out there that, that deeply care and want to take action. Um, and I would just echo what Dr. Shu and Dr. Heho have advocated both in this session and in their work is that, in, and to follow up on Emily, is like, we have to act. Um, the waiting time has ended, we need to act. So that's the, I mean, that is scary, but I do think it's important for people to realize, but from a cool standpoint, from a value standpoint, you don't have to be any kind of person. You don't have to be liberal, you don't have to be Democrat, you don't have to be Christian, you don't have to be religious. Whatever your values are, there's something for you to do. Yes. The thing about sustainability is there is no simple answer. The good part is, there is no simple answer. It's gonna take all of the answers. So it's gonna be all of the above. So you're gonna do an action, you're gonna do an action, and it's gonna be right. It's gonna be different from the other person. It doesn't matter. But do that thing, and it doesn't matter what your orientation is, there's something for every one of us to do. But the key thing is to do something. Absolutely, well said, well said. And I'd like to commend you all for um, doing something and joining us tonight. Um, so I want to thank our guests on the stage. And I also want to give a special thank you to the Riley Institute and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute for hosting this series. I've never participated in one of these events before. And I have just been completely floored these last three plus weeks in seeing behind the scenes everything that goes into a series like this. 
I've always taken these types of uh, events for granted. I show up, I sit in the audience, I think about it, I go home. And it is a tremendous feat um, to see you know, the, the events from ideation through the um, conclusion tonight. So just thank you so much to the Riley team and to the Ollie folks for hosting us. Um, and I think just everyone who's been involved deserves a huge uh, round of applause. So thank you. Now, Matt, Matt, can I just make one? Yeah. A plug for uh, after this, we have the student engagement sessions, and I would make a plug because we do have uh, some of our thesis mm -hmm. students. So firm and advantage, our students are out there doing summer research. Here's a great opportunity for you students to see what research looks like and for you in the community to see what research looks like. And for those of you that financially contribute to Furman and you want to see what benefits it has uh, and students who want to act, there's a bunch of student organizations out there that can get you plugged into acting. So thank you and I hope to see you all out in the lobby.